father, husband, brother, and son deeply committed to continuing struggle for freedom, justice, and transformation. He graduated with the highest honors from both uh, Morehouse College in Political Science and Princeton Theological Seminary, where he studied religion and society. And it is our joy and pleasure to welcome you, Reverend Njumbe, to be with us today as you speak on Beyond the Talk, Surviving Violence, Victimization, and the Viral Pandemics. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me now. Just nod your head if you can. Thank you. Uh, it is, a, it is an, an awesome privilege to be here with you and to be a part of this conversation, which I understand is one of your first conversations, if not your first conversation. So I, I consider it to be a special blessing to be a part of this at the beginning, and I look forward to what um, lies ahead. Now, I have a limited amount of time and you know, I think they always say, you know what it means when uh, uh, a preacher looks at his watch, absolutely nothing. Uh, so I, I, I have to, to remind myself with the stopwatch here of, of being very uh, careful of our time because we have a lot of information that we want to deal with in going beyond the talk, surviving violence, uh, victimization and viral pandemics. So. I hope you can also see my, my shared screen, and we are going to, to try to move quickly. Uh, my, my invitation to come here before you today was prompted by doing a similar sort of talk uh, with the community in Princeton, New Jersey, which is where my church is located. And there's an organization called Not In Our Town and the Princeton Public Library invited me to come and to share with a group of individuals who were in the early stages, relatively early stages of dealing with this global pandemic. I believe it was May the 4th. And my talk in Princeton was on the topic, sheltering in the place of privilege, legacy and consequences. And in that talk, I began to deal with the ways in which the community faced another epidemic, another pandemic, a hundred years earlier, uh, the Spanish flu or Spanish influenza 1918, which lasted about 26 months. And I compared and contrasted how community and the community in Princeton dealt with and addressed that uh, crisis in 1918 and how we were dealing with COVID-19 in 2020. And looking at the parallels in terms of the intersections of the realities of race, and the realities of class and, and how certain things were exposed and magnified in the midst of, of, this, of this pandemic. And we connected with Myra and Tanya and we talked about trying to do something similar uh, with Pensaukin and having this conversation and looking at what was happening in community in the context of this global pandemic. And then in the midst of the global pandemic, we had this other virus come to our consciousness again, and the reality of, of violence, of state violence, the, the reality of police brutality, the reality of mass mobilizations uh, in response to injustice and demands for justice and peace. And so we had to make a transition. We had to make a transition and an integration uh, in terms of looking at the realities of how communities are addressing and responding uh, and dealing with the realities of race and class in the midst of a global pandemic, but also in the midst of a very heightened season of awareness of violence and the reality of state violence and abuse and oppression and discussions and difficult discussions and important discussions around race. So my, my talk today is though about some of the talk about that. Uh, and I wanna get into it a little later, but one of the things that came up very early in the midst of the responses to what happened with George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and what was happening in terms of the mass mobilizations of the response in terms of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, is I had a number of my white friends, a number of my white colleagues that came to me and they know that I'm a father and they know that I have uh, twin daughters that are 22 years old you know, just finishing up their college education. I have a, uh, an 18 year old son who's just about to start and go off to school. And so they asked me about 
uh, whether or not I'd have the talk. Uh, and it's become clear to me that we have to go beyond the talk. We have to go beyond how we understand the talk, how we frame the talk, what is contained within the talk. And we, we have to truly hone in on how we're gonna deal with the realities of violence, of victimization, and a viral pandemic. So I wanna just go through, you, you're seeing some images here that we'll come back to, but these represent some of the intersection of violence, of victimization, and of a viral pandemic, which we're gonna to address tonight. So I wanna start first with where I started in Princeton. I wanna talk about the Spanish flu, and some people are tired of hearing me talk about it, but I think it's very, very important that 100 years ago in 1918, this country and our world on some level went through this before. We were in the midst of a viral pandemic that spread all across the United States, that spread all across the world. And I am convinced that there are things that we can learn from history, that past is prologue. Malcolm X said that history is best qualified to reward our research. And if we want to know how other people, if we want to know how we can deal with issues today, we need to see how other people before us dealt with issues, whether that be in their successes or in their failures. And a lot of people are unfamiliar with the Spanish flu, but I, but I need to say to you, as you see in these images here, this is not the first time where we've been having to wear masks. Uh, if, if you were able to look all the way over to the far right of this picture here, the, the, the woman has, uh, has, a, has a sign on that says, wear a mask or go to jail. Uh, the, the, the mandate for wearing masks when going out in public, when going into business, the, the mandate to, to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds, to sing the alphabet song so you can make sure you do it long enough, the, 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 even the encouragement to, to eat onions and other sorts of things which were supposed to help you to be able to survive the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu was serious. It was serious in the United States. It was serious in New Jersey. You know, when I had this talk in Princeton on May 4th, at that point they were projecting that there, there, there might be a couple of hundred, there might be a hundred thousand deaths that would come as a result of the, the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. We've already passed that number. Uh, now the projections are that we are gonna go well over 200,000. And, and, and we're starting to realize if we didn't realize it before how serious this is, but I say to you that the Spanish flu resulted in the loss of 675,000 lives. 675,000 people in the United States alone died from Spanish influenza, died from the Spanish flu. There were up to 50 million around the globe that died. So even in our worst case scenarios and projections that come from the CDC, we're nowhere near what it is that we went through in terms of loss of life when it came to the Spanish flu. And so we must look at our history. And yes, there's some things that are different now. There are more people now. You might, you might imagine that our public health protections are so much better, but as I, as I have studied and examined the history of the Spanish flu in 1918, which lasted about 26 months, and we're gonna talk about that, and we should have known when, when we had people and presidents and others that were projecting, oh, this is all gonna be over by Easter. Oh, this is all gonna be over by May 15th, and, and people will be able to come back to school. We should have seen and learned from the history of pandemics and epidemics in our country, the, the life cycle or the death cycle of these types of crises and know that this is something that we have to prepare for for more than a minute. As much as we want to wish it away, we can't just close our eyes and think if we stop testing, that that means that people are not getting sick. If we simply ignore it or imagine that it's, it's a conspiracy, that somehow that's going to protect you from actually getting sick or getting someone else in your, in your family sick. The other thing that's interesting about the Spanish flu is it, it wasn't even the older people. Uh, the the, the so-called immunocompromised population that were the, the greatest victims. It was people between the ages of 20 and 30 years old who were the greatest victims of the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, 1920. And we saw how it mutated and changed. And so there were mild seasons and there were, there, there were, there were more aggressive seasons in terms of the disease. And, and we'll get back to this a little later about the, 
about being prepared and surviving this, this viral pandemic, even as we move to the fall. I know we're getting happy. It's starting to get hot outside. We don't want to have these masks on. We don't want to be covered up. We don't want to be wearing gloves. We want to be able to be out and about and doing what we do, but we need to, to study our history and learn from the history of, of disease in this country. Um, I, want to, I want to move quickly and just say that, that uh, and move to a couple of other slides, that you know, the same masks that we saw in 1918 are the masks that we are, are, are wearing today. Some of the same restrictions, some of the same realities, and, and some of the other things that are very similar are the realities of, of race. And you know, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the talk. And before I get to this slide, in terms of the uh, the, the, the the slave revolt that we that, that we that we see here, I want to talk about the the history and the talk that we need to have. Now, I could ask by a a show of hands, how many of you have had the talk with your kids? How many of you have had the talk about how you survive an encounter with law enforcement? How do you make sure that you make it home? How do you speak in the right way so that your tone is respectful? How do you make sure that your hands stay on the steering wheel? How do you, how do you navigate through the reality so you don't become a victim like a, a Trayvon Martin or a Michael Brown or a George Floyd or a or a Breonna Taylor or, or a Sandra Bland. We have been asked as those in the African-American community over and over again. I know some of my African-American sisters who were on this call, and I don't know if we have any brothers yet, I couldn't see, but we've been asked if we have the talk with our children. We've been asked if we have helped our children to understand how to navigate the realities of race. And, and I say, absolutely. Absolutely, we have, to, we have to have the talk. We have to teach them how it is that they can avoid certain contradictions and certain situations and certain dangers. But I submit to you that talk will not save us. That talk by itself is not sufficient. When we look at, at some of the people who have been killed as a result of police violence in this country, they weren't teenagers or young people who simply didn't get the talk when they were younger. Eric. Uh, Eric Garner was, was 44 years old when he first said, I can't breathe. And, and George Floyd was, was 46 years old. These were grown men. These were people who had lived lives. These were people who had their own children and had given perhaps their own children the talk. And that talk alone cannot save us, that we have to make some fundamental changes in policies and realities. We have to make some fundamental shifts in terms of how policing is conducted in our communities if we are going to create a situation where we will not see a continuation and a repeat of the history that we've been seeing decade after decade, century after century, year after year, going back hundreds of years. But I also want to say to our and I say this all the time to, to, to my white friends and colleagues that call me, have you had the talk yet? Sit with that for a minute. Have you, white parents, white grandparents, white aunties, white uncles, have you had the, have you had the talk with your children? Have you had the, the talk with your children and say, don't grow up to, to kill black people? Don't grow up and, 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 to, and to not value the life of a black and brown people as being fully human? H have you had the talk about how to be anti-racist? Have you had the talk about how not to, to, to imagine that if, if, if someone has gone to jail or if someone is being arrested or if someone is having a confrontation with the police, that it automatically means that they are criminal, that it automatically means that they must have done something wrong? Have you had the talk? If white people do not have the talk with their children. And if white people do not have the talk with, I mean, uh, Officer Chauvin is somebody's family, somebody's son, perhaps somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's uncle. So we need to be having conversations. Y'all need to be having conversations with your husbands, with your fathers, with your sons, with your cousins, with your uncles and say, don't kill black people. Black lives matter. Fully human. You know, you know there, there was a song, and I don't know who sang it. It said, "Mama, don't let your boys grow up to be cowboys. Don't let don't don't let your sons grow up to be killers." And that starts with teaching history, and that and that starts with with grounding and rooting us 
in conversations about how we can change the realities that we're facing. And so I want to begin the talk with looking at our history. And, 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 I, and I first just want to say that when we, when we see and we visualize what we, what we have in our communities and on the news and when we see the fires and when we see the uprisings and when we see the rebellion and when we see the quote violence and when we see the quote looting and when we see the quote rioting, I want you to know that this is not the first time that we've seen this before. And when we look at it at a his, in a historical context, it might lead us to think about and look at what we're seeing today a little differently. One of the first and the largest recorded revolts, slave revolts, and we call them that now, was in 1712 and was called the New York African Slave Revolt because there were so many Africans who had just come from Africa who were involved in this revolt. Today, we see it as an uprising. Today, we understand it as a revolt. Today, we see it as people who were rising up against bondage, against oppression, saying that, that we have a duty to fight for our freedom. We have, a, we, have a, we have a duty to win. We have a duty because we have nothing to lose but our chains. But then, at that time, it was called a criminal riot. Then, at that time, it was called simple acts of mindless, senseless violence. Then, it was called a destruction of of, of, of private property and public property. Today we call it a slave revolt, but when we look and we see what we're seeing in our streets today, the same language is being used in 2020 that was used in the 1700s. It's criminals, it's riots, it's looting, it's, 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 it's violence. There's very little attention and focus and concentration on the source, on the cause, on the context. I suspect 100 years later, 300 years later, it will be viewed differently. But if we don't want to re keep repeating the same things over the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 100 years, we have to begin to change not only how we, how we talk about it, but how we see it how we understand it, how we imagine it. There have been revolts and rebellions that have been going back for hundreds of years in this country. The Stono Rebellion in South Carolina in 1739, the New York Conspiracy in 1741, the Mena Conspiracy in Louisiana in 1791. There was the whole Haitian Revolution, which at its time was called rioting and looting and violence, but that lasted from 1791 to 1804, the Haitian Revolution. Gabriel Prosser's uprising in Texas in 1800. In 1803, you had an Igbo landing in Georgia. In 1822, you had Denmark, B.C. in South Carolina. In 1831, you had Nat Turner's Rebellion. In 1859, you had a white man in league with, in solidarity with, in unity with other enslaved people, John Brown in Virginia. There is a legacy of resistance. There is a legacy of rebellion. There is a legacy of pushback in response to violent oppression and bondage. And it has always been called in its moment, rioting, looting, violence, criminal, activity, but how fundamentally different is it today from what we've seen before? Now, some of you will recognize this one, Crispus Attucks and the Boston Massacre. Crispus Attucks and the Boston Massacre, who on the evening of March 5th, 1770, there was uh, British troops fired into a crowd of angry American colonists. And they had said to have taunted and violently harassed the, 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 the troops, the, the, the police, the, the soldiers, and, and, and five colonists were killed. And the event became known as the beginning, the source, the spark, which helped fuel the outrage against the British rule and spurred on the American Revolution. Now, among those killed by the British, the first to fall, was a middle-aged man, a sailor, a rope maker of a mixed African-American and Indian descent known as Crispus Attucks. And when he was, just, and, and in some reports, they said the police had no choice, that the troops had no choice. They feared for his life. He was a tall man. He was over 6'2", 6'3", 
uh, and, and people were a lot shorter in the 1700s than they are now. So he was towering over people. He was a big, burly, muscular black man. And when they saw this man coming, they said, oh, they feared for their life. And so they had to take him down. Now, today, we remember him as the spark in the, in the beginning of the American Revolution. 1770, he was a big black thug. He was a criminal. You know, we see the same types of troops organizing today. And I just ask, and I'm not, and I'm not telling you how you must think or how you must see, but I'm asking you to consider what it is that you are seeing and what it is that you are concluding within the broader context of history. I ask that you consider how this will be viewed 100 years later, 300 years later. Do we see any parallels? Do we need to have any talk about what are the similarities between what's going on with police violence and, and, and police brutality and police murder? When, when we have presidents say that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. We see that going back to a, a legacy of violence, of state violence, of abuse, but it goes back even further than segregation. It goes all the way back to the origins and the beginning of this country. Now, we tend to think that only black people and brown people are the ones that are the ones that have rebelled, are the ones that have been accused of, of rioting or, or, or looting or or, or, or being violent, but I want to just bring your, your historical memory back to the so-called Boston Tea Party. Isn't it interesting how we called it a tea party? When there was rioting and there was looting and it was a political protest, which occurred on December 16, 1733 at Griffin's Wharf in Boston, Massachusetts, that they were protesting taxation without representation. They were protesting economic violence. They were protesting economic abuse and they took and they looted 342 cases of tea and looted them and destroyed them and throw them over into the water. They, they belong to the British East India Company. And the event was a major act of defiance for the British rule. But if you looked at how the British defined it, they were thugs, they were criminals. And in fact, they even tried to mask themselves as such because they dressed up as Native Americans. They dressed up as Indians. So they would not be recognized and they would not be identified, but they rose up and this rebellion is now something that we celebrate. We celebrate this as an example of, of people resisting oppression, of people standing up, but they were looting. Be very clear. They were, they, they, they were doing some things that we see that look very similar in 2020. But they were looters and they were criminals and they were thugs. And, and, and you might um, be interested to know that most of them in the, in the Boston Tea Party were under 40 years old. And there were at least 16 teenagers that were a part of, of this rebellion. But this rebellion, the, the 342 cases of tea, the, the value of that would have been about a million dollars in damage in, 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 in modern times. A million dollars in property damage came as a result of that. And so we need to know that there is a long legacy in history and we need to have that talk. But I need to talk about some other riots. I need to talk about some other looting that we oftentimes miss when we try to simply associate this type of response. And if we really want to talk about violence, if we really want to talk about, about rioting and looting and thug insurrection, then we need to look at places like Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. In 1921, there was an area of Tulsa, Oklahoma called the Greenwood District, which was known as Black Wall Street because it was one of the most prosperous African-American communities in the United States. But on May 31st, there was an accusation that there was a black man named Dick Rowland who had, had attempted to rape a white woman named Sarah Page. And the whites refused to allow the justice system to, to do an investigation or even to see what had happened. And immediately in this month, and this month over a course of two days, there were acts of unprecedented racial violence and looting and 35 blocks went up in flames, over 1,200 homes were destroyed, 300 people died, 800 people were injured. This was a riot. This was a complete destruction of a community, the loss of life. And there was no encouragement, oh, just make sure you're nonviolent. 
Make sure you're peaceful. Make sure that if you if 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 you want to 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 make your petition or appeal that you that 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 you do it in the correct manner. We forget this history. They they they, they didn't even teach this history in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in fact, if you if you look, I believe that still this weekend that the president of the United States is planning to do one of his, his kickoff rally for his presidential campaign in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the same month where the Black Wall Street massacre occurred. And he's gonna do it in an arena where there's 19,000 people, and we're gonna get back to this, this uh, pandemic here in just a minute, and, and, and all of the public health officials are saying to everyone, don't go. Do not go, if you wanna be safe, do not go, but we have, Black Wall Street riots, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We have Rosewood, Florida, which some of you may know about in 1923, which was an attack on a predominantly African-American town in Rosewood, Florida by large groups of white aggressors. We don't even know how many people were killed there. Bodies were burned, bodies were buried. They're still finding bodies. But this is an example of a legacy of violence, a legacy of rioting. And I don't want us to ever seek to situate it with one group of people. Now, I don't seek to try to justify it. I don't seek to try to even, e e even to, to, to explain it away. But I want us to always to be in consideration of what we're seeing today within a historical context. And that brings us back to a viral pandemic. And I think this is important for us to know and to remember because a lot of us are excited about the summer and we're, and we're hoping that the curve is flattened and we have all these different things that we're looking forward to. But I need to remind some of us who are in this part of the country of the Liberty Loan Parade that was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on September 28, 1918. It was at the end of World War I. And people were ready to celebrate. And if you look over here and if you look, there's nobody wearing any masks. But this, is, this was in the midst of the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu had begun in the spring of 1918. And there had been hundreds of thousands of people who had died from the Spanish flu at that point. But they wanted to get out. They wanted to celebrate. They wanted to focus on their liberty and their freedom and their right to take that mask off and march. And there were 200,000 people that marched in Philadelphia. And it began the explosion of Spanish influenza in Philadelphia, one of the hardest hit cities in all of the United States, which as I said, later 675,000 people later perished as a result of the Spanish flu in the United States. And so I say to people today so often, I said, remember, remember, it got worse in September. Remember, remember, it got worse in September. That is the flu season. That is the season where it is more likely that this virus could have mutated and spread. Yes, we are praying for a vaccine. We are praying for a cure. We hope that there is a way. But we, if we want to survive this, we have to stay aware and conscious of our history. As young people say, we have to stay woke. And to be woke means to have your eyes open, to be aware. I learned the, the, the importance of, of, of you can have faith and you can have trust, but being woke is important. I used to, I started my ministry in New Jersey. I came from Alabama before I was here. But when I came to New Jersey, one of my first ministries was in the streets of, of Trenton, New Jersey. And I was dealing with the reality of violence. And I was dealing with the response to when, when men and women and young people were being killed in the streets and I would go within 24 hours and go to the spot where people were killed and I would, and I would pray there and I would take my Bible and I would lay it on the spot where the person had, had perished and I would pray. But very quickly I realized that I had to discover something which I now call open-eyed prayer. Yes, I was praying to God. Yes, I was trusting God, but I needed to keep my eyes open and I needed to be aware of where I was and what was happening and what my surroundings looked like because God, the God that I serve wants me to use my, my, my mind, my heart, my body, my spirit, all of it. And we have to think, we have to learn from our history. Those who do not learn from their history are destined to, to repeat it. And my people will perish due to a lack of wisdom and a lack of knowledge. We can't make the same mistakes that they made in Philadelphia. We can't do the same things, but when we look around and when we see the refusal to comply, when we look around and when we see the demands for us to rush to reopen, when we look around and we see 
a president that refuses to wear a mask. We, we even know that it, it's, it's suspected that Woodrow Wilson, who was the president at the time, even contracted the, the, the Spanish flu, maybe even had a stroke as a result of it. We look around and we see people resisting people in the name of liberty and patriotism and their freedom are going into a viral pandemic unafraid. And we oftentimes see the reality of race and these things showing up because when we look in our communities, whether it be in, 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 in Camden County, whether it be in Trenton, whether it be in Princeton, what we are finding is those who are the greatest impacted, those who are testing at the highest rates of positive infection are people of color, are African Americans. I, I, I spoke at a, at a rally yesterday, yes, with my mask and gloves and everything else, but, but, but I am convinced that the, that the Latino community has just as high, if not even higher rates of infection in certain areas, because we know when we look at statistics that the brown community are most frequently undercounted and miscounted in terms of statistical analysis. We're seeing that with every census, we'll see it again in this 2020 census. And so we have to know that that's not because there is a, a, a greater uh, a vulnerability or, or physiological proclivity to catch disease. It's because that when you are in compromise, you're, you're an essential worker and you have to go to work every day. You're an essential worker and you're going out into the workforce and you're coming back into your home that may be a smaller space. You don't have a big, huge yard. You don't have the space. And so you can't keep six feet apart and live in the same house with people. We, we, we find that same thing happened 100 years ago and, and, and people were, were, were infected at, at high rates in the beginning, I'll say. And I'll say this as a warning for, our, for, for, our, for my white brothers and sisters. In the beginning, we had very high rates of infection for people of color. And when they saw that, they said, yeah, see, African-Americans, they didn't call them that, that, you know, ha have, have, a, have, have a, a biological inferiority, which leads them to be more likely to catch diseases like tuberculosis and all kinds of viruses. And, and that was a, a match that said, oh, well, the reason why they, they get the flu more is they have wider nostrils. And so they're bre breathing in more of the, the, the particulate and the disease. But if you, if you look ultimately at what happened with the Spanish flu and the viral pandemic of 1918, the actual greatest number, not just in numbers, but proportionally, of the 675,000 people who died in the United States were white people. Were white people who had been uh, privileged in terms of not having to go out and perhaps work in the same way that the laborer, the day laborer or the washwoman or the maid or the cook had to, yet they did some of the things that we see here. They, they participated in, in, in liberty parades in, in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They, in their privilege, they imagined that somehow they were immune. And, 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 and I can say, I do not believe that COVID-19 coronavirus discriminates against anyone. You can get it if you're black, if you're brown, if you're white, if you're red, if you're yellow, if you're young, if you're old, and we all have to be safe and we all have to be mindful of the realities of what it is that we're going through. We have, to, we have to have talk about how we prepare, but ultimately we have to look to next steps. How do we implement policies? How do we implement programs? How do we implement strategies that are going to allow us to survive this struggle, th these crises over the long term, whether it be the, the crises of violence, which comes from state violence, whether it be victimization that comes as a result of oppression and the isms that we see in our community, whether it be our, our current struggle with the coronavirus. You know, this is just an image that I took of the, the Paul Robeson Center, which is right up the street from my church. Paul Robeson grew up in Princeton. He grew up in our church. His father, William Drew Robeson, was the pastor of Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church for 21 years, was his longest serving pastor. He became pastor in 1880 and left in 1901. But this is the, at the uh, Paul Robeson Center on the Princeton Arts Council, which is next door to the house where he grew up, the, the Paul Robeson House of Princeton. And, and when I see it, I see the, the, the connection between our, our very present moment and the legacy of the past. And so I wanted to share it because it reminds us, and I hope it will help us to understand 
how we will begin to survive. The way that we will begin to survive is yes, we need to have talk. Yes, we need to talk to our children. Yes, we need to, to talk to our cousins, our brothers, our fathers, our husbands. Yes, we need to do all of those things. But those talks, those talks need to be within the context of history. I'm not going to tell my child that you need to keep your hands on the steering wheel, you need to make sure you say yes sir, no sir, without also helping them to understand the history that though they may be criminalized, they are not criminals. Though they may be called certain things, that's not who and what they are. Because if we don't begin to, to change our minds, yes, we can change the talk, but if we don't change our minds, we'll never change our policy. We'll never change our strategies. There's a, there was a, a and, I'll, and I'll close with another uh, figure from history. There was a, a student activist in the, in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. His name was Stephen Biko. And Stephen Biko uh, organized against racial oppression and he organized against the apartheid government and he organized against the, 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 the violence which was being visited upon the people of South Africa. And he experienced, he lived, he was ultimately killed as a result of it. But one of my favorite quotes that he shared with the movement was he said, the most powerful weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The most powerful weapon in the hand of the oppressor is not a gun, is not a tank, is, 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 is not a, a, a tear gas canister, it's, it's not any sort of militarized weapon of war. The most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. And these conversations, these conversations that you need to be having in Penn Soccer, these conversations that we need to be having in Princeton, that we need to be having in New Jersey, that we need to be having all around the country, it's not enough simply to change a president. Oh, yes, I'm going to vote. I already filled out my mail-in ballot. It's done for the primaries, and I'm looking forward to November. But that in and of itself will not change it. Because every, remember, Michael Brown and Ch Trayvon Martin were killed when Barack Obama was president. Let's remember that whether it be, that, 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 that yes, we had, we, we had uh, the Rodney King incident, which was in, um, during the time of the Bush administration. But when we have the crackdown and the violence and the expansion of the, of the police state and the system of mass incarceration, it was during the Clinton years. Simply changing people out of offices is not in and of itself our solution. We have to begin to come together, to talk together, to think together, to change the way we think, and then to, to do more than just mobilize. This is my last thing. I think I'm at 35 minutes. My last word is that mobilization is critically important. I've been to probably more Black Lives Matter protests and mobilizations than I should because, you know, they say you should quarantine yourself for two weeks after you go to one of these big masks. And, and, and I'm doing vitamins and I'm doing gloves and I'm doing masks with filters and everything else. But I say that mobilizations are easy. It's easy to have a unity of thought for a moment and not move to a unity of action. And so that's what I want to encourage you as you go into your breakout groups and, and your discussions. Yes, let's have the talk. Yes, let's have the hard questions. Don't just ask me if I'm talking to my black children. Tell me if you're talking to your white children. Don't just ask me if, if, if I'm preparing myself to be able to survive. Tell me whether or not you're talking to your husbands and your brothers and your, and your uncles and your fathers and your sons about how it's unacceptable to take human life. Yes, we understand it's a hard job. Yes, we understand it's a broken system, but we cannot tolerate the types of, of, of abuse and violence that we have been seeing recently and we've been seeing for hundreds of years. Yes, we need to have the talk, but how are you talking about what you see on the news? Do you see rioters? Do you see looters? Or do you see revolt? Do you see rebellion? Do you see simply violence? Or do you see Crispus Attucks? Do you see Boston Tea Party? Do you see 1712? Do you see Nat Turner? Do you see Denmark BC? Do you see John Brown? We have to begin to go beyond the talk that we've been having. 
and have some different kind of talk and have some different kind of thinking and some different type of action. The, the right ideas must come first. And correct action begins with correct ideas and correct ideas will come from the correct type of talk. That's what I want to encourage us to do as we move forward, not only into our breakout groups, but as we move forward in this struggle, which is not over. It will not flip overnight, whether that be the virus of white supremacy, whether that be the virus of COVID-19, whether that be the virus of us needing to change our minds from seeing ourselves as victims, as, as looters, as rioters, and, and shift our thinking and see ourselves as freedom fighters in the tradition of the Tea Party and the first of all Christmas addicts. So I thank you for hanging out with me for just a minute. And I look forward to you coming back from your breakout groups and us continuing this conversation.